Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's Resurrection Sunday morning. We're so glad that you have taken the time to tune us in. If you're watching on Sunday, this is a tremendous day. It's the greatest day ever. If you're watching on Monday or Tuesday or any time further on in the week or month, we're just so honored that you're here. We'd like you to take a moment and uh, share this broadcast. If you, Whatever platform you're on, would you just take a moment and, and share it with a friend or text someone, Facebook them, let them know what you're watching. Let them know that uh, Life Community Church is, is live and ready to go this morning. In just a few moments, Sherry Williams will be leading us in worship. Our entire worship team uh, has prepared some incredible songs, and they're going to be singing and leading you in worship. And I encourage you not just to be a spectator, but to be a participator. In other words, uh, open your heart and worship on this tremendous day or, and, and let the Spirit of God touch you and refresh you. We're also going to be coming to the Lord's table in communion. Now, communion is one of the very few ordinances of the church that Jesus left to us, all right? So he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. In other words, you're calling me to a loving remembrance. So when we take the elements in just a few moments, we're saying, Lord Jesus, we remember that your body was broken. We remember, Lord, that your blood was shed. We remember what the cross means for us. We remember that you're no longer on the cross, but you were buried and you rose again on the third day. You see, my friend, that's the truth of the gospel. God's wrath was was against man because of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. Someone had to shed blood. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So in just a moment, when we drink the cup, it's a reminder that it is the blood of Jesus that was shed. I don't have to die for my sins. Jesus has already paid the price. He's done what was necessary to appease the, the anger of God and to provide salvation and deliverance and forgiveness of sin. All that we must do is trust Christ. That's it. You trust in the completed, finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes in the righteousness with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So, so we're going to be bringing you some tremendous songs. We're going to be praying together. And if you have a prayer need this morning, you'd like to send it to us, you can certainly do that. Uh, just contact um, the number there on your screen and contact uh, us at Life Community Church. We'll be more than happy to connect with you in prayer and take your needs to the Lord as well. So if you don't mind, take a moment and go through the house and see if you can come up with some communion elements. Would you do that? If you have any grape juice, use that. If you have any wine, that'd be all right too. If you have some crackers, which are unleavened uh, wafers or bread or something like that, uh, get that prepared because in, a, in just a moment, we're going to be taking the bread and we're going to be saying, Lord Jesus, thank you that your body was broken. We're going to be taking the cup, the fruit of the vine, and we're going to say, Lord Jesus, thank you. And we're going to call him to a loving remembrance. It's a connection. It's a time that we share in common with the Lord Jesus. That's what the word communion means, is a sharing in common. Let me share with you quickly a little something I discovered the other day. It's amazing what a difference a one simple letter can make. Years ago, when people were still using typewriters and a church secretary uh, had a, a form letter she would send out to people who visited the church, and she would type it each week, and it was supposed to say, it was a joy to have you and your family worship with us on Sunday. Well, one day the church got a letter back uh, with a humorous little note that said, um, you, 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 you typed the wrong letter, and it reads, it was a job to have you and your family worship with us on Sunday. Do you see, just one little letter makes a huge difference in meaning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul wrote to the church about a critical area of doctrine. He said the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, that was the doctrine. And he said, there's a heresy that's being taught uh, that Jesus did not really rise from the dead. So Paul was, was trying to put that false teaching uh, aside. He was trying to, to, to get rid of that. So he contrasted two little words separated by one letter. They both begin with the letter I, and they contain two letters. One of those words is, is the word if. The other is the word is. Paul begins by saying, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then the following things are true. Our labor is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Our, we are false witnesses of God. We are still in our sins. The dead in Christ are lost. 
We're of all men miserable. But then he alters that one little letter and declares in verse 20, but now is Christ risen? Not if, is Christ. He is risen from the dead. And because Christ is risen, our labors for him yield eternal results. Our sins are forgiven. We have the assurance of eternal life for ourselves and for our deceased loved ones who trusted in Christ. You see, my friend, one little letter can make a big difference in our lives. Well, thanks again for joining us this morning. Why don't you just open your heart and sing along with Sherry and the team. And I'll be back in a few moments to share communion with you and also uh, uh, some scriptures and a message from God's word. So be refreshed today. Be encouraged today. We're people of the resurrection. I'm telling you, this is our time to shine and shout and rejoice because of what Jesus has done for us. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met you
Father, thank you today for your presence in our lives. Thank you for this beautiful holiday, Easter, that we celebrate in churches across Oklahoma and the United States and around the world today, celebrating the victorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Thank you for what that means to me, God. Thank you for what that means to my family. Thank you for what that means to my church. We are grateful. We are so grateful today, God, for your presence. 
and for life that we find through Christ. And we worship you today and we celebrate you today. And it is because of you, Father, that we can face tomorrow and anything that comes our way. God sent his son and they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he bled and died to buy
Resurrection Sunday. What a tremendous time uh, this is. As I mentioned earlier, this is the greatest day ever. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, let me tell you something. This is the day Jesus rose from the dead. If he had not have risen from the dead, we would have no hope that our sins are forgiven. We would have no hope for heaven. There would be no hope for those who've died in the Lord. Our, our loved ones have gone on in Christ. They would just be dead and no future. But Jesus rose as the first fruits of the resurrection. And there will come a day when he will return to this earth, my friend. And when he does, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Their bodies reunited with their spirits and will go to be with him in the air. What a glorious thought. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the greatest day ever. We celebrate 2,000 years later, but what happened uh, two days later and 30 days later and 40 days later? You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't immediately go to heaven. The Bible records that he walked in his glorified body. He walked and talked, preached and prayed with his disciples and with the crowd, one crowd of over 500 people. So there were over 515 people who saw Jesus alive as eyewitnesses to the fact that he was risen from the dead, but not all the disciples believed. So some of the things that may surprise you, number one, the disciples were skeptical. The gospel records are clear. Many of the closest followers didn't believe the early reports. For instance, when the women who saw Jesus alive reported, they came back from the tomb and uh, they reported, the disciples said, it's an idle tale, we don't believe you. The Gospel of John tells us of, of, of Thomas, who was one of the closest followers of Jesus. And Thomas, uh, the other disciples had seen Jesus, but Thomas wasn't there. And he said, I'm not going to believe until I can see him. I'm not going to believe until I can touch him. Some of the disciples had doubts even when they saw Jesus with their own eyes. On, the mount, on a mountain in Galilee, when Jesus appeared to 11 of his disciples and they worshiped him there, yet Matthew reports some doubted. What does that mean for us today? Well, you know, it kind of gives me a little hope. If the early disciples, the early church doubted and were skeptical, I don't feel so bad for my skepticism and my, you know, my doubting from time to time. And we as believers, we're going to face skeptics. Not, not everyone is open to receive your Christian testimony. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Be ready. Be prepared always, but do it with gentleness and respect. The second thing that the early church did is they broke bread in Jesus' memory. You know, it appears that the Lord's Supper, which we're about to partake of in just a moment, um, was put into practice very, very early, perhaps within days of the crucifixion. It's always been fascinating to me what happened to the early church after the resurrection. Because, we you know, we build up toward Easter. We've celebrated Palm Sunday. We've celebrated the Holy Week and the Passion of Jesus and Good Friday. And now here we are at Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. And then we, we tend to kind of put it on the shelf, you know, and just go on with our lives. But we can learn so much from what the disciples of Christ experienced uh, those days and weeks and months after the resurrection. So the second thing is they broke bread in Jesus' memory. A story related uh, in Mark and also in Luke <clears throat> concerns two followers who had an encounter with the risen Jesus near the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now these two fellows were walking down the, the road talking to one another uh, about the events of the past weekend, how that uh, Jesus had been crucified and that they buried him and then the tomb was empty and, and the other disciples didn't know where he was, where is his body, we don't know where his body is. And so they were talking about this uproar uh, among the disciples. And uh, so, so as, they're, as they're talking and walking down the road, Jesus just appears to them. Now, he doesn't let them know who he is. He, he's just kind of, you know, they don't know. They just think he's another uh, pilgrim who's been to uh, Jerusalem for, for the Passover holiday or something, and they don't really know who he is. They didn't even recognize him, but they invited him to come and eat with him, which is very common in an Oriental culture. They're showing hospitality, and they said, come and eat dinner with us. The evening is late. The day is done. And so they invited him to their home. And at the table, Jesus took the bread that they offered to him, and the Bible says he blessed it and he broke it 
and he gave it to those two disciples. And Luke records that when he gave them the bread, their eyes were opened and they realized this was the Christ. They couldn't believe it. They, they just, you know, he acted like he was just going to walk right past their house. And that's when they invited him in. And, and, and now all of a sudden, he's, this is Jesus and he's right here with us. And then, then the gospel goes on to record this. And I love this. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Listen, my friend, when you have an encounter with the resurrected Lord of glory, something's going to burn on the inside of you. I pray that this uh, post-Easter uh, time, this season in your life is the most fruitful and productive for the kingdom of God. I pray that you'll have a boldness that you've never had. I pray that you'll have a sense of, of urgency that you've never had to share the gospel. I, I pray that you'll be willing to bring your family together in times of prayer, in times of worship. And while we're in this coronavirus lockdown, my goodness, let's not complain and, and bicker and and let this thing fester in us. Let's utilize this opportunity that we have to spend time with Jesus. Some of us are having more time in our day than we have in a long time. It's, it's as if our society has just slowed down all around us. Take time to let the word of God be real as you feast on the bread of life. Let your eyes be open to see Jesus. In fact, when we take this bread and this cup, I hope you've prepared it already there in your house, wherever you are. I, I hope that you're prepared now and we're gonna do like the early church did because not only did these disciples break bread with Jesus, but it was clear from the New Testament that his earliest followers followed his command from the Last Supper to do this in remembrance of me. Do it in my memory. So according to the book of Acts, after the Passover, the disciples broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So this morning, I'm taking these elements of communion and I will be holding them in my hand. And I, I don't have the power and authority to, to bless these. I certainly can't turn these into the literal body and blood of the Lord Jesus, but we can celebrate what he's done. We can remember him we can recall all of his goodness in our lives so would you join me as we do that right now the apostle paul received a revelation from god and he said on that last fateful night jesus took the bread and after he'd blessed it he broke it and he said take eat this is my body do this in remembrance of me Father, we thank you. You're the God of the universe. You give us bread to satisfy us. This bread that we partake of today in this communion time, Lord, we don't count it lightly. We consider it symbolic of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we remember what he's done for us. Then Paul said that he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. So Father, we thank you for the cup, the cup of suffering that our Lord Jesus um, was willing to bear on our behalf. I'm reminded of the words in the Garden of Gethsemane where he said, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But if not, then not my will, but thy will be done. Thank you, Lord, that your will was done and Jesus went to the cross, that he endured the shame, the suffering, the beatings, the humiliation, all of the things that Jesus went through. Thank you that he did that on my behalf. He didn't have to do it. He was the sinless one. He was the innocent lamb that was led to the slaughter, but he died in my place. Then I thank you, Lord, that he rose again on this glorious day we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. Oh, what a glorious time it was when the early church realized that Jesus was alive. Thank you for their example, Lord. May we learn and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The third thing that the early church did was that they searched the scriptures. I love this. They searched the scriptures. And I think maybe some of their skepticism led them to do this, but there were, there were uh, with a few exceptions, all of the earliest followers of Jesus were devout Jews. They were steeped in the traditions and the laws of their ancestors. And so it was natural for them to search their ancient holy books, the holy scrolls. 
And they looked for explanation for all these extraordinary events that were happening. Jesus' followers searched the Jewish scriptures, often using the Greek translation that's known as the Septuagint. The book of Acts describes how that the apostles, particularly Peter, explained in great detail the meaning of passages in the Hebrew Bible and how they explained Jesus' life and mission. You see, all you have to do is go to the Old Testament, which is what these men had, okay? And throughout the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Torah, you discover Jesus. I mean, there he is, the Messiah's life, the Messiah's mission. It's, the book is full of, of it. And, and, what, and what they don't recognize today, so many of our Jewish friends, is that Jesus has fulfilled all this. And this is why we need to share with him. This is why we need to teach. This is why we need to proclaim Jesus is the Lord of glory. You know, Philip did the same as, as did uh, Peter when he ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch. It's a powerful story in the book of Acts. When you get time to look it up, it's incredible uh, what, what happens there. Paul and Barnabas, they explain the Jewish scriptures in synagogues throughout Cyprus and what is now central Turkey. So you see these early um, first century believers sharing the scriptures. They're always going back to the word of God. They're searching the scriptures. My friend, listen, anything that happens in your life spiritually, you need to be able to back it up by the word of God. I'm not interested in some extra biblical experience. I'm not interested in anything that I can't find in the pages of God's word. Listen, the, the Word and the Spirit will always agree. The Holy Spirit won't ever take you on some tangent that the, that the Word of God won't, won't, uh, won't, won't line up with and won't uh, anchor for you. It's, it's, a, it's just a truth that the Spirit and the Word always agree. Now, the meaning for Christians today from this thought on, on searching the Scriptures is that we should be like the residents of Berea. Uh, these men and women receive the gospel message, the Bible says, with great eagerness, Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. And then they searched the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You know, as a pastor of a local church, it does my heart good to know that God's people are searching the scriptures every day. Don't just take it for granted what I teach you. Don't take it for granted what you see on television or, or something you picked up on the internet. Uh, don't just believe some podcast because that's a good-looking guy or he's got a good-looking line or a good-sounding line or something. No, no, no. You study it out on your own. Take the time to dig into the Word of God and find out if what is being said to you is true. The fourth thing, I, I, I want to share with you this morning, the fourth thing that the early church did is they took care of the sick. They loved and ministered to people who were hurting, hurting physically, hurting emotionally hurting um, spiritually. And a major component, I don't know if you know this, but a major component of Christ's mission on earth was healing. 25 of the 37 miracles attributed to Jesus in the New Testament, that 65% of his miracles are miracles of healing. Hmm. One of the first things the Gospel of Mark says about Jesus is that he was a healer. Mark 1.34 Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Jesus also commanded his followers to do the same. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, then you've been commanded, commissioned and ordained by the Lord Jesus, empowered by the Lord Jesus to do the same. He called his 12 apostles and instructed them. He said, guys, I want you to go and heal every disease and every affliction. I'm sending you out. In the book of Luke, Jesus sends out 72 of his disciples as, as, as ambassadors, emissaries, if you will, of his kingdom. And he said, I'm instructing you specifically to heal the sick who are there and to tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 10 and verse 9. You know, the very first miracle recorded in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles now, after the resurrection of Jesus, is the healing of a lame beggar. The first miracle after the resurrection. It wasn't um, uh, money uh, just showing up somewhere. It, it wasn't, you know, uh, any other thing. It was a healing. Can you imagine? It was the healing of the guy. He was a beggar. He was a beggar because he was crippled. He could not work. 
And he sat by the gate of the temple all of his life, every day, seven days a week, and he begged. And he depended on the generosity of people. And so, so he was seated on the steps. I want you to get the picture now. There's this thing called the beautiful gate. And uh, the beautiful gate is, was probably referring to the spectacular bronze doors of the temple that were donated uh, by, by a craftsman uh, from Alexandria, the beautiful gate. And he's sitting there in front of the beautiful gate. The gate's made of bronze, but yet this man has nothing. So he's begging. The temple had bronze, but the man had nothing. So Peter says to him when he sees, he cries out and says, uh, would you help me? Would you give me some money? And, 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 and Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, please understand, this is the same Peter who just a few days previously had been hiding in a crowd and denying the Lord Jesus, denying that he ever knew him. A little, a little girl, a little maiden girl came up to him with her warming their hands by the fire. One evening, and Jesus is inside being, being tried, uh, and, and, and he's on trial for his life. And Peter's outside. He doesn't know what to do. And this little girl says, I recognize you. You were with the Galilean. Your accent, I can tell. You're, that's where you're from. That you're with Jesus. And he cursed and, you know, and, and, and said, don't, don't say that. I, that's not me. I don't even know this guy. And then, then the rooster crows. And when he heard the rooster crowing, he realized, oh, I've denied the Lord Jesus three times. Exactly what Christ told him he would do. Now, this is the man who was anointed by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This is the man who shortly after the, the, the um, resurrection of Christ says to the guy who's been crippled his whole life, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, listen, you don't say rise up and walk to a cripple, a, a lifetime cripple, unless you've got some confidence or faith from somewhere. And this Peter had been with Jesus. He had seen the resurrected Christ, the Lord of glory. And he knew that Jesus was risen from the dead. And in that power and that anointing, he says to the man, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now I want to say to you this morning that you, my friend, if you're a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you have been commissioned to, to pray for the healing of sick people. You've been commissioned to say to the lame, rise up and walk. Those who have been crippled, maybe they're not physically crippled. Maybe they're mentally or emotionally crippled. Maybe you have someone in your family or your realm of influence or where you work with them and, and life has just dealt them such a horrible deal, man. And they're crippled. They can't get up. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't function. Their relationships don't work. They can't pay their bills. They're addicted to some kind of a drug or some kind of an alcohol and they're just crippled. May I suggest to you that that anointing that was on Peter is on us as believers and we must shout to them, rise up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk in the name of the Lord. And you know, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, Peter and the other disciples are engaged in a healing ministry through a number of different instances. In fact, if you'll read Acts chapter 9, you'll discover incredible that Peter uh, was able to uh, bring healing. And he also caused a woman who was dead to be resuscitated to life. Can you imagine? Old Peter, the fisherman, God was using this man in the early church. Now, ever since the uh, early church, Christians have been involved in medical mission work. You see it everywhere around the world. Building hospitals, establishing medical organizations such as the Red Cross. Uh, the original hospital for the sick in Paris, France is called the Hotel du and it was first opened in 651 A.D. And get this, it still operates today in the very same location. A hospital, can you imagine, opened because Christians were following the command of Jesus to love the sick and to help the sick and to heal the sick. Here in Ada, we have a Mercy Hospital. And when I visit that hospital, I see on the walls everywhere that I go their mission statement. The Mercy Mission Statement of their hospitals and their clinics reads like this. As the sisters of mercy before us, we bring to life the healing ministry of Jesus through our compassionate care and exceptional service. Isn't that amazing? The healing ministry of Jesus. 
You know, we should remember that medical missions have been an essential part of the Christian witness from the very beginning because not only are we called to lay hands on the sick and to pray for the prayer of, the prayer of faith, but God has given incredible wisdom through modern medicine to go hand in hand with prayer. I'll never forget when I first began to read of Oral Roberts' call. What, regardless of what you think about Oral Roberts, God called him to merge prayer and faith in modern medicine. And in those days, uh, that was unheard of. There's a, there a whole group of people that turned away from him. They, they didn't believe medicine had any place in a Christian's life. They just wanted to trust God in faith. And, uh, but yet he said, you know, God can use the both of them. And he was absolutely right. I see it every day. Uh, wonderful healthcare professionals who are gifted. God's blessed them and, and enabled them. And they bring healing to people's lives in marvelous ways. I told uh, my doctor just the other day that I, I, I was praying for him. We talked by phone. I couldn't get into his office because of the coronavirus. But on the phone, I said to him, listen, I pray for you and other uh, healthcare professionals that God would bless your families and your homes and protect you in the midst of this crisis we're in. And he thanked me for that. And you know, we need to be doing that more often. Number five, the fifth and last point in my message this morning is what the early church did. And I love this, man. They invited others into their fellowship. They invited others into their fellowship. In the 20th century, some New Testament scholars claimed that Jesus never intended to launch a movement or form a fellowship. But that is exactly what the earliest Christian records Declare, the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament are emphatic that Jesus instructed his followers to make disciples of all nations. My goodness, that's the Great Commission. All nations, all ethnos is the Greek word. And it means people groups. We have been called to every people group. Just a few moments ago, as we were worshiping from our uh, stage and auditorium here at Life Community Church, we were leading you in worship. You might have noticed a young man who was singing, his name is Joel. Joel is from Uganda. And uh, he's lived in Uganda all of his life. He came here at 19 years of age to attend college at East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. He's singing on our worship team, this young man from Uganda. You know, I'm stirred when I meet a person from another people group like Joel. Here in Ada at our university, we have, I don't know, we have dozens of, of, of different nationalities, ethnicities represented. God has called us as the church to reach every people group. And from the very beginning, this was Jesus' intention for his followers. He challenged Simon, uh, who later he renamed Peter. He said, listen, if you're going to follow me, you're gonna, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And that was one of the metaphors Jesus used uh, to, to represent the kingdom of God. He said, it's like a fishing net. He said, and I quote, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind, red skin, black skin, white skin, every kind of fish God's interested in. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So within weeks of the resurrection, the followers of Jesus were inviting everyone who would to listen and come into their fellowship. According to the book of Acts, after Peter's sermon to the crowds that had gathered on the day of Pentecost, there were about 3,000 people joined the community in one day. And I'm going to tell you something. They did not all look like me. They did not all talk like me or you. <laughs> there were at least 14 different people groups on the day of Pentecost that were added to the church. So as Peter cast the net, he became a fisher of men. You know, in the ancient world, um, as it is today in so many parts of, of our world and our nation, Religious groups are often exclusive. There's prejudice among social classes, among genders, among religions, among races. It's that way today. There was very little tolerance for those who weren't in your particular group. But you know, Christianity has never been like that. Jesus has taught us and instructed us to have a welcoming attitude. And there's a sociologist by the name of Rodney Stark who points to the phenomenal growth of the Christian movement, the church. He said it can be explained largely because of this attitude of Jesus' followers. They, they, they welcomed groups that were scorned by other religions like women, like slaves, like Samaritans, like foreigners. 
And they were saying through their word and they were saying through their deeds, we care about you. We care about what happens in your life. They were saying God loves you. God welcomes you into this family, his forever family. And, and, and I don't know about you, but it's really been stirring my heart during this time of crisis when, when it's like all the stores are shut down and they want us to stay in our homes and we can't interact with people. It, it, my heart has been stirred. And I, I just want the love of Jesus to be shown to the world again by the church. So I want to encourage you as I close this message to let this, the heart of Jesus uh, dwell in you so much so that after the resurrection, we're celebrating the resurrection today, okay? But life goes on, and there's so much more to do after the resurrection, post-resurrection, if you will. There's so much to do. And if you read the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, John 13, John 14, John 15, he talks about loving one another. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You know, this sociologist Stark says that uh, the church, the Jesus movement, if you will, grew at a rate of about 40% per decade. Started initially with about 1,000 followers. At the end of the second century, there were 217,000 followers. To then, uh, today, there are over 2 billion followers, 2 billion believers on the planet. That's about one out of every, hmm, one out of every four people on the planet who call Jesus Christ their Lord and believe that he raised from the dead and believe that he's coming back one of these days to take us to be with him for all eternity. Listen, the rapid growth of the church was due to the other steps the disciples took. And let me give them to you again in review. Number one, they patiently wait, answered the skeptics uh, and the skepticism of their critics. Number two, they broke bread in memory of Jesus as we did today. Number three, they searched the scriptures. Every day they searched the scriptures. Number four, they took care of the sick. Number five, they invited others into their community. And these proclaimed to the world what Jesus and his followers were all about. And I say this morning, may God help us to do the same. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Just right where you are. Take a moment to pray. And if you're here today and, and you're, you're in a condition of life that know that you're not right with God. I know there's there are many watching me today on this video that would testify to that. You'd say, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not right. I, I've never never trusted Jesus Christ for salvation. Or, or maybe you have, but gotten out of fellowship with God. And you really want to be restored. I want to pray with you right now. If you'll just pray this prayer with me, just say, dear God, I believe that your son Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And that you raised him from the dead on the third day. I want to be a person of the resurrection. I want to celebrate life and not death. So forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I want to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to hear from you. and love for you to contact us and let us know what God has done for you. Now, let me just take a moment to speak to the believers in the room as we pray together. I believe there are many of us who, who want to not just not just go to church. You know, this, this season has shown us that the church is not a building. We can't get in the building. I believe I'm talking to people who don't want to just be, they don't want to just go to church, but they want to be the church. They want to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus, his mouthpiece, as it were. If that's you, let me pray over you right now. Father, I just bless the believers who are watching uh, this video today. And on this tremendous uh, celebration of resurrection, may their hearts be stirred, Lord, to be your hands and your feet, to go and to send and to be sent for the cause of Christ. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks, everybody, for tuning us in. And uh, be sure and, and, and meet us right back here Wednesdays. We're doing a, a prayer gathering. We would love for you to be a part of that. It's 6.30 on Wednesday nights, right where you found us, the church Facebook, YouTube, whatever the platform is that you're viewing me today. Share this message with someone. Listen, if this has encouraged you, it'll encourage someone else. If this has blessed you, bless someone else by sharing it with them and tell them what you've heard today. Be a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May he lift up his countenance upon you. May angels go before you in goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen.